Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 68, which reads as follows. Tanchakam mangkatang sadhu yang katwa nanutapati yasapati to sumano vipakang patisevati which means it's actually the same as the last verse so there's a chat in here chat means end no so uh, the last one was about problem of doing bad deeds well this one is tancha and that kamang and that kamma uh, katang sadhu when done is well done yang katwa nanutapati which when performed uh, doesn't burn one up, no? Doesn't cause one to burn up. Yasa pati to sumano, which one, uh, the performing of which, because of which, uh, one is delighted and sumano of good mind or, or of, of happy mind. Vipakam pati sevati, when they receive the results. So when you receive the results of a deed and it's pleasant and um, peaceful and gives you a makes you happy at mind, happy at heart, this is a well done deed. Tanchakat kamangatang sadhu. That dhamma is well done, sadhu. So the story behind this verse is uh, in the time of the Buddha in the kingdom of King Bimbisara uh, in Rajagaha, which is a kingdom, it's now a city in uh, north northeastern India or northern India in the province of Bihar. It's one of the places we go on our uh, pilgrimage of the holy sites. Uh, Bimbisara was a Sotapanna when he first met the Buddha, he listened to the Buddha's teaching, he realized uh, Nibbana at the moment of uh, listening to the Buddha's teaching. So he was a special king and so therefore a special kingdom. And it so happened that in this kingdom there was a gardener named Sumana. And the story goes that every day he would collect eight measures of flowers every morning and offer them to the king for which he would receive eight kahapana which is eight gold coins and one day as he was collecting his flowers in the morning he saw the Buddha coming for alms followed by 500 monks or, or a large company of monks and he'd never seen the Buddha before I guess and this morning when he saw the, that morning when he saw the Buddha it uh, overwhelmed him with, uh, with the great joy of seeing such a spiritually enlightened being, being in the presence of someone who is so powerful and so cultivated. It just struck him quite uh, deeply, moved him. And so immediately he thought, what could he do to reverence this person? Because this is... Uh, it's a tradition in, in religious cultures like India to, for, for ordinary people who maybe didn't have their sights set on a spiritual life to pay reverence to them. They figured, the, figure, the, the idea is, well, we, we can't live our lives like you, but we can honor your life. And in a way, there's something to that. It, it, it's a reaffirmation of what you believe in. So a person who pays respect or, or reverences something that is worthy of, of reverence, it sets in their mind, it affirms in their mind what they believe in. So I believe in what this person is doing, my contribution to their cause, and so on and so on. So anyway, if it seems somehow strange that this is what he would immediately think, it, it, it's what religious people often think, religious lay people, that, that even though they themselves can't live the life, they want to uh, support it. And by supporting it, it, it affirms in their mind their dedication to that type of a path. And uh, it's, this is the good karma, so that in the future, good things come from it. So immediately he thought, what can I do? And he looks and he sees these flowers that he's preparing to offer to the king. 
And he thinks to himself, these flowers, I'll give these flowers to the Buddha. And just the thought arises in his mind, and then immediately the, the second thought arises, ah, but these are the flowers that I'm supposed to give to the king. And so he's got this dilemma, because kings in the time of the Buddha, of course, were known to be rather harsh in their uh, meeting out of justice or, or in their judgments of their citizens. So there was some fear for the ki for, from the king, uh, from the king's reaction. So he thought to, thought to himself that the king could have me beheaded or, kill, or, or execute, uh, exiled, banished from the land. But as this thought, as this worry, as this fear is coming up in his mind, he, sh he shakes it off and he says, I don't care. This is, this is it. If uh, the king doesn't like it, if the king banishes me, I just think, what can the king do for me? The most that the king can do for me is give me wealth in this life. He can give me these eight kahapana every day and it allows me to feed my family. That's all he can give me. But the Buddha... This guy, who I've heard about but I've never seen until today, what he can give me, what he can give me is something spiritual. And by my dedication and my devotion to him, uh, it's something that could last lifetimes, millions of countless lifetimes into the future. And so he makes this up his mind and he says, if, if he, he makes a decision, if my mind is pleased by this, I will do it. And immediately this pleasure and this joy comes up just from the idea of offering, paying respect to such a worthy uh, object. And so he, he, he makes the decision and he offers the flowers. And he, he, in India they would um, place the flowers on his feet or so on. The story in the, in the uh, book, I'm not going to really subscribe to it. It's, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but... Um, it may not have happened that way. So, so the way they say it happened in the book is when he threw them up, he threw two measures above the Buddha and they, they, they hung there suspended. And he threw two measures on the, over the left side and the, and, and the left side of the Buddha was a curtain of flowers. And then he threw them up on the right side and they stayed suspended on the right side and he threw two measures on the back and, they, and so there was like this cave of flowers surrounding the Buddha that, that was just floating there. And then he walked through the city with these flowers suspended around him. But I'm going to sort of not deny that, but we're going to bl blurb over that. We're going to skip over that and say he offered these flowers. He offered the flowers to the Buddha, and it was a great thing. It's a great sacrifice. Because it's not, it's not that he, he was obligated to the king. It's that kings... You don't enter into the contract the same way as you would with an ordinary person. If a king expects something, usually they get it, whether or not you've promised or whether or not it's... It's not like these flowers belong to the king. You know, the story of Kudrutra, which is, I think, also in here somewhere. Uh, she actually stole flowers from the queen. Uh, this, we went through it, right? This was the story of uh, Samavati. We've already been there. So Kujutra was her maid and she stole flowers from, she stole money from the, the queen uh, and instead of buying flowers she'd only buy half the flowers and give her half the flowers, the other half the money she would steal for herself. Then one day she listened to the Buddha's teaching and uh, came back with all the flowers and the queen asked, well, why, why is there twice as many flowers today? And, and Kujutra had become a Sotapanna, so she, she had no interest in, in lying whatsoever. So she told Samavati, Queen Samavati, I've been stealing from you. Every day I've stolen half the, flower, stolen half the money and bought you half the flowers. But, and so what's different today? Well, today I heard the teachings of the Buddha and there's no way I would steal after that. And Samavati was, of course, a great being and uh, she didn't, wasn't angry at all, and instead she took Kujutra as her teacher and asked Kujutra to go and learn all of the Buddha's teaching and come back and teach them. Okay, so that was a bad thing that she had done. Kujutra was a thief in the beginning. He's not a thief here. He's not stealing these. He's the gardener, and as far as we understand from the story, they're his. But he's got an unspoken contract, or maybe even a contract with the king to sell them to the king for eight kahapana. 
He doesn't do that. He offers them to the Buddha. Then he goes, pays respect to the Buddha, bows down at his feet, and goes back to his wife. He goes back home. His wife greets him at the door, and normally he'd bring the flowers home, prepare them, and offer to them, them to the king. She asks him, where are your flowers today? And he says, well, I, I saw the great f fully enlightened Buddha walking for alms, and I offered the flowers to him. And his wife is, is incensed by this. His wife is a simpleton, according to the books. Moga Purisa probably is what it says. I didn't check the Pali. Uh, and she's upset by it. And she says, that, are you crazy? We could be we could be killed. The queen is uh, the the kings are 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 dangerous people. He could have us beheaded. He could have us exiled. And and he repeated what he had said. He said, you know, this the, the, you know the, whatever the king can do to me, it's nothing compared to what the Buddha can do for us. Uh, but she wouldn't have any of it. She took her children and left him and went to see the king and told the king exactly what happened and said, explained to the king what she had said to him, how, how you know, please, if you're going to punish my husband, consider that he's no longer my husband. I've left him. Me and my children are now separated from him. We had nothing to do with this. If you're going to, to punish him, punish him, him alone. Of course, King Bimbisara is, uh, as I said, quite a special being, and, and so he wasn't angry at all, but... He, uh, he he realized that this this he realized what had happened and he knew the gardener Sumana was a great man and hearing this of course it, it it made him only think higher of the gardener Sumana and so he realized this woman is probably not right for the gardener anyway she's a she's a Mogapurisa and so he pretends to be angry and he said oh he did he said he did what and she repeats it and he said are you saying that he he took the flowers that he was going to offer to me, and she said, yes. And he said, well, thank you. You've done the right thing by leaving him. Of course, she has, because it's good for him, good for Sumana. You've done the right thing by leaving him. Uh, leave it to me. I'll see that he gets his just, his, uh, just desserts. Yes. And the, the woman goes away satisfied, thinking that she's won the day. And Bimbisara immediately, the king Bimbisara immediately gets his retinue and goes to see the Buddha, pays respect to the Buddha, and they walk together. The Buddha, of course, realizing that the king, knowing that the king is at peace and has no resentment for this flower, uh, uh, flower situation. And so they walk together and they walk back to the king's palace and... They sit down outside of the palace and the people are all able to see these flowers suspended above and around the Buddha. Just skip over that. Um, but then the Buddha calls Sumana over, the gardener. He calls someone to bring the gardener Sumana to them. And the Buddha asks, what is it that you said? When, what, is it, what did you think? What were you thinking to yourself when you offered me these flowers that you normally offer to the king? And... Sumanus, with the king sitting right there, he said, I, I thought to myself, no matter what the king can do for me, the best he can offer me is physical wealth. But the Buddha, what the Buddha can offer me, what I can get from paying respect, paying homage to such a great being, uh, that is something that will last me much longer, will be much more lasting and, and of far greater benefit. And Bimbisara immediately spoke up and, and praised him and offered him uh, eight elephants, eight horses, eight male servants, eight female servants, eight uh, concubines from the royal har harem, and the eight other stuff, all sorts of things, eight of each, and made him a rich man. Eight measures of kahapana, eight, eight thousands of treasures or something, lots and lots of money, made him a rich man. And... Uh, that was that. And so the, the Buddha went back to the monastery and the monks, uh, Ananda, right? Anand, Ananda asked the Buddha, he thought, wow, this must be a great thing. I wonder what he, he's going, what, what benefit would he get from this deed? And, and the Buddha, he asked the Buddha and the Buddha said, Ananda, don't think that this is just an ordinary deed that the gardener did. This is something that with his true, truly um, 
pleased and delighted mind, uh, delighting in goodness, delighting in the good deeds. In the future, in some future time, he's going to be reborn as a Pacheka Buddha called Sumana. So the Buddha foretold that someday, probably Sumana is still up in heaven somewhere, um, waiting to be reborn as a private Buddha, or maybe it's already happened. But someday he will become a Pacheka Buddha. Then one day the monks were sitting in the hall of Dhamma talking about this, saying, wow, it's great, it's amazing how he could do such a good thing. Isn't it great? The doing of good deeds, isn't it a, such a great thing? To, great to see the benefit. Uh, great to see how good people are rewarded for their good deeds. And the Buddha walked in and asked them, monks, what are you talking about? And the monks said, Venerable Sir, we're talking about Sumana the gardener. And they tell him what they were saying. And the Buddha said, indeed, monks, a deed should be done, those deeds should be done that lead to happiness and peace, that when performed do not cause one to feel remorse, don't make one um, burn up in the mind. And then he said the verse, Tancha kamanka tang sadhu yankatvana nutapati yasa partito sumano vipakam patisevati. So how does this relate to our practice today? Well, good deeds, doing good deeds never gets old. This is one part of the, one part of these stories. Um, the the virtues never change. So there's there's nothing different today about doing good deeds. Any good deeds that you can do, not just offering, not just giving, but any good deeds, helping other people, um, teaching other people. But um, you know, meditation is considered the greatest good deed, and the greatest wholesomeness, um, and morality ethical precepts, um, pro, uh, stopping, abstaining from uh, unwholesomeness. These are all good things. The point is that this is what leads to real happiness, and this is what the meditation shows us. It's amazing. People today, the, the happiness that we look for, and uh, we do things knowing, really we know, often, often we know, intellectually, that these things that we're doing are not bringing us happiness, these activities that we engage in, the sources of happiness that we're pursuing are not actually making us happy, are not actually satisfying us in any way. They make us suffer physically, they make us suffer mentally, they cause arguments and, and conflict between people. They don't lead to happiness in any appreciable form. And yet we cling to them, we chase after them because of the way the mind works, because of the reward cycle, the, 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 the chemicals in the brain, the pleasure that they bring for a brief moment uh, reminds us and, and reaffirms the habit and causes us to seek them out again. These are the things that don't bring us happiness. What really and truly brings us happiness is goodness, is good deeds. And so the Buddha said to f to to focus our, our attention on good deeds, focus our efforts on good deeds. This is a great way to keep yourself from falling into doing bad deeds. If you're always caught up, if you're always engaged in doing good deeds, in uh, being kind and helpful to others, in being moral and ethical, and in practicing meditation, cultivating your mind, then you won't have time and your, your, your mind won't sink back into unwholesomeness. Doing good deeds is the greatest way to prevent yourself from falling into bad deeds. So people often complain about how Buddhism today, pop Buddhism, seems to be all about uh, generosity and giving, which you find in Buddhist countries, it's all about giving, giving, giving. And so there's often this, this backlash and people think how, uh, you know, claim how it's not the Buddhist teaching and how you don't really need to do any good deeds, just practice meditation. Of course, meditation is a good deed, but people who say you don't have to do good deeds, all you have to do is stop stop doing evil. Um, Mahasi Sayada once, once pointed out, which I totally agree with, and if you're not, as I said, if you're not doing good deeds, then it's very easy, or it's very difficult to keep yourself from doing bad deeds. And what are you going to do besides unwholesome deeds? It's very difficult to keep yourself from them if you're not engaged in good deeds. So the benefits of goodness, they bring you, it brings you happiness, it purifies the mind, it creates habits of goodness, it turns you into a better person, it brings physical well-being, it calms your body, 
It allows you to digest your food better. It allows you to sleep better. It brings you friends. It brings you uh, riches. It, it brings you security and safety. It calms the world. It purifies the world. It makes. It brings goodness to the universe. It changes destiny. Good deeds that should never be um, should never be seen as as uh, should never be looked down upon. Na, how does it go? Nati chitte pasannam hi apakana matakina. There's no such thing as a small gift if given with a, a pure heart. Is one thing. It's not what I was thinking about. Nati. Uh, uh, you shouldn't look at a kam, at a karma. You shouldn't look at a deed as being small. No deed is small. Uh, but that's about bad deeds. Anyway, there's lots of lots of quotes about good deeds and bad deeds. This, karma is so important because it um, it changes you. So if you're performing good deeds, it makes you a better person. It allows you to calm your mind. It allows you to cultivate. Wholesomeness. If you're performing bad deeds, good luck with the meditation. Not going to happen. Not going to go very easily. So um, this is a part of our practice. It's it's really a, a fundamental step, becoming a better person, being generous and kind, being moral and ethical, and being calm and composed in the mind. So that is the teaching for today. And as for the as with the one together with the one last time, it makes a pair that um, we should just not do bad deeds. If, if a deed makes you suffer because of it and, and makes you feel guilty because of it, you shouldn't do it. You know, should focus on doing good deeds. Do those deeds that when done, um, you don't burn up, you don't feel guilty. And when you receive the results of them, they, it's happiness, it's peace, it's um, delight, and happy at the results. So. That's the teaching for today. Wishing you all peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. See you next time.